Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to have a panel of such esteemed experts on press freedom um, as part of Partner Day on this uh, fabulous conference. And thank you so much, UNESCO, for having us. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to kick off with a quick video that we're going to share with you, created by the One Free Press Coalition. Um, Jesse, could you please turn that on? The role of a journalist is to uncover and to relay the truth, to empower people through knowledge, to hold people to account, to tell the stories that otherwise people in power wouldn't want the world to know about. It's a risky job because you go beyond what people see, you go beyond what people hear. I think journalists are the new enemies of the state and the reasons why they are enemies of the state is because they are bringing out a truth which is so uncomfortable to regimes. One of the most important things that gives you the confidence going into those war zones is knowing that there would be an army of journalists 24-7 campaigning day and night for your release. I never could imagine the outpouring of support that I received, especially when I was arrested. I was released because of the level of domestic and international mobilization that I had. It is now important more than ever in history that we support good journalism, that we support free press. So much, Jesse. Um, so as everyone is uh, certainly aware, today's conversation focuses on creating champions, cultivating capacity building, um, public defenders and public champions of press freedom. And all of that really stemmed from a question that we in the press freedom community hear a lot, which is how can we help? What more can we do? And I think for those of us, you know, those of us on this call, certainly and a number of the people tuned in today, uh, deeply entrenched in the freedom of expression space, when a journalist comes under threat, the stakes are very, very clear. The victories, when they do happen, feel hard won and are understood. An iconic photograph of someone leaving prison, a rousing speech upon somebody's return home, uh, an unprecedented legal victory. But from prison releases and damaging laws and those killed in the line of duty, it's often difficult to convey to the public um, just how much their sustained advocacy and sustained support can have an impact. Increasingly, we're seeing media bodies, like some of the ones represented here today, Forbes and Al Jazeera, uh, become increasingly vocal in championing issues of press freedom, safety of journalists, recognizing that their role in informing the public and sharing information can only be really realized uh, when journalists, those that work for them and beyond, can work without fear of reprisal. Before I turn to my esteemed panelists and colleagues here today, I just want to give some quick context to the state of press freedom globally. In the past four years, we've seen record numbers of journalists behind bars around the world, at least 250 each year, and the majority of those on charges like anti-state, terrorism, propaganda, an increasing number of them jailed on fake news charges. Last year's annual census for the Committee to Protect Journalists saw a record-breaking 279 before, behind bars. And what was the beat most likely to land them in jail? Politics. Human rights and corruption were close behind. Already this year, five journalists have been killed in the line of their work. 
In 2020, 32 journalists died in the line of duty. Of those, almost 70% were targeted for murder. For women journalists, persistent threats of gendered violence or being denied reporting opportunities also has a devastating effect. If the bylines aren't diverse, as our colleagues at IWF remind us, the press is not fully free. Over the last year and a half, COVID-19 has brought into stark relief just how essential journalists are, essential workers even, recognized around the world, and how critical access to information is. Access to the truth this past year became a matter of life or death for many. Many governments seized the pandemic as an opportunity to clamp down on access to information, tightening restrictions, or muzzling critics. As the world moved increasingly online, the scale of online abuse and harassment amplified. And according to the IWMF's research, more than 70% of women that they surveyed said that they were considering experiencing, sorry, more online abuse than before, and nearly a third of which were considering leaving the profession of journalism altogether as a result of it. There's a running theme through these statistics. Journalists seek to report the truth regarding injustice and violence and hardship in their own countries. Governments deem their reporting a threat to power and target journalists with other threats, harassment, imprisonment, or even death. For groups like the Committee to Protect Journalists and the IWMF, who are uh, here co-sponsoring this event today, um, advocacy is how change happens. And increasingly, we're seeing traditional media organizations take up that mantle as well. Today's panelists include journalists and speakers from Forbes and Al Jazeera, media groups who are active on press freedom and central to organizations and campaigns like those led by the One Free Press Coalition. These efforts on the part of both civil society and media demonstrate a solidarity that is central to protecting the public's right to be informed. But how can we build better information literacy around not just media content, but around media safety? What should the role of the media be in promoting press freedom? And what can we learn from successes in cases like the two journalists joining us today about how to better engage or better encourage involvement from the public when press freedom comes under threat? With that, I'd like to turn to our first panelist, Neha Dixit. Neha, would you introduce yourself and explain a little bit how you came, uh, came to be a part of, of the One Free Press project or uh, you know, central to some of these advocacy campaigns? Uh, Thank you, Kerry. Very happy to be part of this panel. My name, I'm, I'm an independent journalist. I'm based in Delhi. And I um, usually focus on politics, gender, and social justice in South Asia. Uh, a couple of my uh, uh, investigations in the last five, six years include uh, uh, how basically a number of extrajudicial killings by Indian police of people, particularly from the, from the Muslim community in India, uh, a couple of other uh, investigations include how the Hindu right wing has been trafficking children from northeastern parts of the country and sending sending them for the purpose of indoctrination. And uh, 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 another recent investigation included how a uh, number of people again from are targeted from cert certain communities and imposed with draconian laws and imprisoned such as National Security Act. So a couple of these investigations did have uh, did in a way, uh, just like I think uh, effective in the way that they did uh, upset the people in power. And which is why it also led to a number of attacks uh, on me. And I would like to say that this is not just exclusive to me in India. Most journalists are facing these kind of threats. Uh, so I've been facing legal cases, legal criminal cases that have been stabbed against me. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, online threats, which I mean, they're so normalized now that we don't even register them any longer. And recently, there was a there was an attack where somebody tried to break in, and there were uh, there was a threat of acid attack. So this is this this is the reason why, unfortunately, uh, or uh, let me say, unfortunately, I did get become part of these campaigns and like the video that, that we just saw about journalists. But um, uh, uh, that was the reason. So which is why the last five, six years I've been dealing with uh, criminal cases. I would also like to say that uh, my, uh, my association is also because in the last five, five and a half years in India, we've seen uh, a, a decline of press freedom. We've seen number of parameters. You just talked about it. But also the fact that 
it's not like earlier journalists were not attacked, but what the difference now is that journalists are being slapped at law and order related cases. The number of death threats, the number of actual physical attacks have increased 200 times. And which is why uh, it's uh, me as part of the journalism community here in South Asia. It's uh, one has to become a part of these campaigns to basically raise the voice. Even now that I, as right now, as I talk, India is, people are dying uh, because of lack of oxygen and the pandemic that is going on. And in spite of that, the Indian government is more upset because of the tweets that are critiquing the Indian government because of lack of health infrastructure available to people. Or Indian government is more upset because of the foreign press critiquing Indian government and not at, acting on time. And which is why uh, we all are facing, there is, there is a, there's an attack on freedom of expression and that freedom of expression that actually also upholds our right to life right now. And I literally mean it when I say it right now in this time of pandemic, that also needs to be upheld. So that's my association. Thank you so much, Neha. Uh, Mimi, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and, and how, um, how you came onto the radar of the One Free Press Coalition? Well, thank you, uh, Kerry, and it was nice to listen to Neha talk about the situation in India, which is practically not different from what we also see in Cameroon. Um, uh, where do I begin? I am Mimi Mefotakambu. I am uh, a journalist from Cameroon. At the moment, I'm uh, working with uh, the, uh, the German broadcaster Deutsche Welle, which is DW, and it is stationed in Bonn in Germany. Um, I am also the founder of uh, one of the, um, the news reports platforms it is online that we have in the country it's called Mimi Mefo Info and I created that uh, precisely in 2018 it's a platform that I actually launched in response to a few to actually fill a, a yawning gap that was emerging um, in the wake of what is now called the bloody conflict in Cameroon's two English-speaking regions. At the time when this platform came into existence, I was actually um, a journalist. I was a presenter and editor with um, a private news um, outlet. It's, it was it's a television uh, um, a media house uh, in Cameroon at the time, a private uh, media house. And anyone actually was um, a journalist and has worked under a repressive regime, like what we heard Neha saying, like also in Cameroon and other parts of Africa would know a thing or two, what it feels like to tell a story um, that the powers that be do not want people to hear. So um, when the crisis, it started like a crisis, first of all, because now it's an armed conflict. It's even a bloody conflict. Many people will call it a genocide. But when it was still at the level of the crisis, what is now happening in Cameroon's two English-speaking regions, um, when it started, I knew that because of the kind of regime that we actually have in Cameroon, it was going to be very difficult to report about what was going on. Um, because at some point in time, the government banned the use of words like federalism. You could not um, mention certain things on air. Um, journalists were scared to talk about what was really happening at the time. And so many media houses were even being shut down. We had journalists that were even being arrested at that time. And with internet, as well shut down because the internet was shut down for several months. So when the internet is shut down, how do people get informed? How do people get the information? When mainstream media, even where I was working at the time, we probably don't have that possibility to cover the story and tell the story of the people how it should be. The only platform that I found that um, could tell the story of the people, could be the voice of the voiceless. That's how I've always called them was the social media platforms that I created. That is Facebook, that is um, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and also on YouTube, because on YouTube, they can shut down media houses, but they cannot shut down your YouTube page. They cannot shut down your Facebook and the world would get to know the people's story if you use these platforms to tell their story. So that is why I, um, it, it was difficult by that time to tell the stories of so many people that were being um, massacred, young people that were being killed in the two Anglophone regions of the country, extrajudicial killings at the time, massive arrest by security forces, and even atrocities that have been committed by the separatist fighters because the soldiers are committing atrocities, and even those who are clamoring for independence are also 
um, uh, committing atrocities on the local population. So I made it like a personal duty to come up with this platform, Mimi Me for Info. I came up with it with a dedicated team of journalists. We said it is very important that we come together to create this platform to inform the people about what is going on. And some of the stories that I even covered, like the brutal massacre of about 40 young people in the Northwest region, that story was never told because um, uh, we, were, we were scared of reprisal attacks from the government. So just to tell you how it's really, really, some of the damning stories that we unearth, some of the stories that have been, have been going on, things that have been going on in these regions, we cannot tell the story of the people because of the regime that we have in place. So um, when I actually investigated in 2018 and discovered that um, uh, the Cameroonian military also killed the, um, the American missionary who was in the Northwest at the time. I was, well, I was not just summoned, I was arrested and I was sent to prison that same day and um, charged, with terror, charged with terrorism. Um, you know, there were so many charges levied against me with fake news charges, just like um, US, uh, you were mentioning earlier. But then, People who orchestrated the killings, because when journalists report, like Neha was saying, what we expect is for the government to investigate and uh, there should be accountability. But when the journalists report, you are instead being targeted, you are instead being called a terrorist, you are instead being called a destabilizer of the nation. So um, those are some of the things that um, has been going on. Um, that's made it very, very difficult for journalists to do their jobs in Cameroon. And most especially the 2014 anti-terrorism law has been very, very, it has made it very, very difficult for journalists to do their work in Cameroon because it's actually being used like that tool to suppress press freedom in the country. Thank you, Mimi. I think that's, that's really helpful and certainly um, a really powerful example of the way that the law has been weaponized against journalists in so many cases. Um, we're definitely going to come back to hear a little bit more about uh, how advocacy supported both of, of you during these kinds of, um, you know, repercussions and, and awful sort of oppression you were facing. But first, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Jessica to talk a little bit about, you know, the One Free Press Coalition and, and how that came to be and maybe a little bit of, um, you know, how you sort of see this moment of, of kind of solidarity with media organizations, which certainly from the press freedom organization side really does feel kind of unparalleled to anything we've seen before. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so the One Free Press Coalition came about um, out of a desire to do more, um, to use our platforms to help our fellow journalists who we've been seeing um, under threat and uh, really suffering from a lot of the trends that, that Carrie mentioned, that CPJ and IWMF have been tracking, um, and UNESCO as well, of course, um, and that Neha and Mimi have experienced personally, trends where there are more and more laws um, that are out there to suppress speech, uh, to, to suppress the free press, and I think just to suppress freedom of expression generally, we're seeing a lot of that happening um, in the COVID area, um, as well as Black Lives Matter and all the protests that are happening globally, right? Because of the economy, the climate, um, uh, conflicts, et cetera. And so governments who don't want to be held accountable, which is what you are out there to do, um, are seeking to use tools like the law um, and like a public state of emergency to suppress speech. And so we've seen this trend growing for years. It's certainly at a height, I think right now, but we at Forbes were wondering how can we use our platform or platforms and how can we in the media collectively use our platforms to help these journalists and really to fight those trends, honestly. Um, and so the One Free Press Coalition is made up of dozens of media organizations, news outlets really, who are looking to use our collective audiences to raise the volume on these cases. So it's cases of um, journalists who are under threat, it's cases of impunity where journalists have been killed or gone missing and the governments have not been found accountable. And so we figured we have such large audiences, we have journalists who study these cases, who report on the news. Um, can we use our audiences in our platform to raise awareness and also to just increase the feeling of solidarity? And I think um, 
Neha Mimi can speak to it better, but there is something that we felt a kind of a personal obligation to use our voices to say, we stand with you. We're not forgetting about these cases. We're watching these trends um, and we're gonna stand up against them. And I think uh, we came up with the 10 most urgent list as a way of sort of drawing attention to 10 cases each month to highlight the, the personal nature of these cases, show their faces, talk about how it's so, um, so much a global problem, right? So we highlight cases from all over the world um, and we highlight different trends that CPJ and IWMF, our partners, highlight for us really um, to talk about pressing trends that are happening that are threats to freedom of expression and threats to these journalists um, and threats to democracy and really a free world, right? So I, I hope that we've been having an impact, but it's really wonderful to see some of the faces here with us who are um, safe and talking about their experiences. But our goal is to use um, our voices to raise theirs. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Satnam, I'd love to turn to you and kind of, I know you're obviously a central, Al Jazeera is central to the One Free Press Coalition and has been a very active member, but I'd actually like to take a step back. You know, Al Jazeera has this really rich history of advocating, you know, both for its own journalists when they've come kind of into trouble or, or, or under threat, but also on issues more broadly, whether that's online abuse of women or safety and conflict zones. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit you know, how does Al Jazeera think about this kind of advocacy? How does that fit into the sort of broader spectrum of things that you do? And 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 how has that history maybe evolved to to where things are now? I think you're still muted. The inevitable uh, unmute. Uh, um, I just wanted to uh, just acknowledge, uh, you know, both uh, Mimi and Niha's uh, struggles. Um, I think that it's a, it's becoming a bigger and bigger struggle across the planet. Um, you know, uh, I've been at the network now for about 17 years. Uh, some of the, some things have gotten better, um, but many things have also gotten worse across the world. And so efforts like what uh, uh, Jessica at uh, One Free Press has been doing is, uh, is is really central and really really important for us as we move forward uh, in this very very complex environment. Um, that's that's emerging. Um, you know, when I joined the network in 2004, it was just a single channel back then. And, um, you know, we faced ongoing attempts to muzzle our output. It was banned in almost every country in the Arab world. Uh, we say, you know, we faced stiff opposition from across the ocean with, you know, Donald Rumsfeld describing Al Jazeera's coverage as vicious, inaccurate, and inexcusable. Um, and, and while that sounds, you know, okay, well, everybody is allowed to say what they're allowed to say, that does create a very dangerous precedent for journalists who are on the field, uh, who, you know, in a sense, other authorities and governments are given license to actually, uh, you know, uh, attack, maim, kill, um, imprison these journalists. Um, and, and we saw some of that also flowing over in the Black Lives Matter recently. Uh, with, uh, with with the enhancement of uh, of uh, you know the, the wordings that you know open doors to allow people to do things which uh, which we would not have actually even imagined uh, you know and it reminds me back in the 60s uh, you know some of the things you saw back then we, I used to watch documentaries about the 60s civil rights movement and some of the the things that happened back then but there seems to be a, a sort of a resurgence of that sort of thing and. It's just it's just been uh, quite a ride for the last 17 years seeing the different uh, you know hacking of social media accounts, harassment of you know our female journalists, you know interruption of satellite signals, you know withdrawing journalist licenses, killing and imprisoning our journalists, and uh, you know shutting out our, our bureaus. And you know very simply, I mean 1996 when when Al Jazeera launched, you know we had set out to create a home for the voices, uh, you know the opinion and the other opinion and. It was a platform for freedom of expression. It was the first time in the Arab world that people who had no voice were able to actually have a voice the man on the street, the mother, the father, the youth, the disenfranchised. And of course, prior to that, only governments had, uh, you know, a voice with state controlled media. So it was a heavy backlash uh, when we entered that, that environment, uh, you know, uh, with, with, you know, uh, here's, here's, I mean, I've listed down a few of the things that, that happened in 2001. 
the US, you know, US missile hit our office in Kabul. You know, luckily our journalists escaped. In April 2003, a US missile hit our office in Baghdad and killed uh, one of our journalists, Tarek Ayub. In 2005, uh, there was a, apparently a leaked memo that outlined the discussion between Bush and Blair on bombing Al Jazeera's headquarters in Qatar. And, uh, you know, since, since our launch in 1996, you know, 11 Al Jazeera journalists have lost their lives in the line of duty, simply just to bring the truth to the public. Um, and, you know, many more have been detained, you know, countless bureaus closed across the world. And currently one of our journalists is, uh, is behind bars for simply just working for, for the channel. Uh, his health's in a critical condition. He's been denied transfer to a medically appropriate center. And this kind of, this, this scenario has played out. So Samuel Hajj, for example, uh, you know, he was arrested in 2001, spent almost seven years undergoing torture and beatings. Um, you know, uh, we hired a legal team led by Clive Stafford Smith, a uh, British human rights lawyer, uh, you know, exceptional human being, really, you know, um, you know, was there alongside us in, in, in trying to secure the release of, of Sammy. And uh, so we collectively kept the pressure on for his release. And, uh, you know, uh, roughly seven years later, they, they released him without any charges. Uh, when he came back to Jazeera, of course, we, um, you know, he had a, had a lot of experience in terms of human rights abuses. And so we, you know, we, he, he actually set up a center called, uh, you know, Center for Human um, uh, Liberties and, and, and Rights. And that, that center exists to today to track the abuses on journalists going uh, on across the planet. And we, we use that platform also to, to, uh, to, to, to look at um, um, a content that we can put on our network that highlights the plight of other journalists all across the planet that are going through uh, very, very difficult times. And of course, it's not just a journalist, but there's a ripple effect into their families and a ripple effect into society uh, you know, um, as, as a whole. Another example, uh, 2013, Three of our journalists, Bahar Mohammed, Mohammed Fahmi, and Peter Greste, were arrested in prison uh, in Egypt uh, after being falsely charged for collaboration with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And so we launched a, a campaign called uh, hashtag Free AJ Staff. Uh, this collective advocacy garnered, you know, around the world was was unprecedented. We we had a global collective uh, mobilization of support with other organizations. Uh, the hashtag reached more than a billion people. Uh, as people put up their pictures on their Twitter and Instagram showing their support. And uh, hundreds of journalists in about 40, some, 40, 40 cities around the world, um, as well as the general public, staged vigils in solidarity with Al Jazeera. And, um, you know, in partnership with, uh, you know, other human rights organizations and, uh, you know, uh, journalist organi organizations, you know, eventually in 2015, the three were released. However, you know, consequently, five other auditor journalists were sentenced to prison terms, uh, you know, and others were handed down death sentences in absentia uh, by the Egyptian courts. And more recently, in large parts of the efforts of the collective ad advocacy through coalitions like One Free Press, um, our journalist Mahmoud Hussein was released and united with his family after four years of an arbitrary detention. Um, and, you know, we we built up a, a mosaic of testimonies, that's what we, we called it, which was really, you know, 40 international media and human rights organizations and bodies uh, supporting the, uh, the effort to, to, to gain his release. And, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do it without all of this uh, participation and advocacy. And, you know, it's, it, it's a complex, you know, it's, it's a complex uh, equation uh, that, you know, it's a financial equation, it's a legal equation, it's an equation of, you know, getting public opinion and, uh, you know, putting dipl diplomatic uh, efforts uh, on the government to, 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 to gain the release. And, you know, a single organization can't do it alone. Now, given the fact that Al Jazeera is a large organization, we have weight, but there are smaller organizations and also individual freelance journalists that don't have all the resources that we do. So this collective effort that we're looking at is, uh, is necessary and it's essential for really uh, you know, uh, in this very, very complex age to allow the freedom of speech to flourish and to be given the due that it needs. Uh, we are in more and more need of discussion of facts, of truth, um, in a time when, you know, uh, the rise of the right and populism and so forth uh, is really, you know, creating a very, very difficult environment for diversity and a difficult environment for 
the freedom of speech and for the institutions that we hold so dear to our hearts for them to be effective without that kind of information. And of course, uh, you know, everybody's heard of the, you know, in 2017, there was another demand to shut down Al Jazeera from, from neighboring countries. And so we've, you know, we've, you know, we, we had to sort of weather that through, through, through the years. So, I mean, in my mind, the impact of press freedom advocacy, it's clear, you know, collective advocacy amplifies the voice of those who are being silenced and um, it brings about greater accountability, change, and most importantly, freedom. Um, I, I think uh, I think it was you, Kerry, that mentioned that, you know, we're living in a time where, you know, information is being weaponized by governments um, to curtail deliberation of freedom of speech, uh, which is just a critical vehicle for human progress. And if we don't have that, we're, you know, we're, we're up against the real wall. So it's really, really important for all of us to be working together and, uh, you know, looking for new solutions, you know, try to unpack what works, what's changing and, you know, what we can, in, what we can do ultimately to uh, inform and uh, uh, galvanize the public governance institutions in support of a free press. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a complex world out there and, you know, you know, I have a job. My job is, you know, I'm the, I'm the director of global brand and communications. I sit behind a desk, but I always say that, you know, the real heroes are people like Mimi and Niha and all the journalists that are out there that are actually on the field and facing these challenges and anything and everything that we can do to support uh, them um, and, and journalists across the world uh, is, uh, is critical at this time. Thanks. Thank you, Satnam. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned a number of really powerful cases, uh, you know, from Al Jazeera's own kind of community. And I think about, you know, you mentioned the journalists who were released in 2015. And I think two of the three of them went on to start their own, you know, press freedom advocacy organizations following that experience, which I think speaks to, you know, how um, how powerful it is to sort of see advocacy in action and, and kind of the lasting impact of that. Um, I also wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned um, that I think is is kind of central to a lot of the conversations we have when we think about cases that are going to be highlighted or people that we want to to champion with and 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 sort of push for you know whether it's a release or a big public campaign being mindful that the need is always greater than we're able to meet you know I, I think about you know we're talking about a top ten list that goes out monthly or, or a campaign on an individual journalist's basis when there are you know hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, but in particular, and I said, and I wanted to pick up on this, the vulnerability of freelancers and journalists who sort of don't have the support of a big major outlet behind them. Um, and I know, you know, Neha and Mimi, you've both been freelancers or independent journalists and, and have sort of been in, in a variety of different working situations um, over the course of your careers. I guess, Neha, I would be really interested in hearing, like, for you, what was the most impactful part or the most valuable part of having, you know, uh, these international organizations come in? I know there's a huge amount of work done and I, I do want to be clear to our audience, there's a huge amount of very important work done by local partners and local organizations and the work of these international groups wouldn't be possible without it. But I, I am curious for you, like what was that experience like having these kind of international groups rise to the call on your behalf? Uh, thanks, Kerry, and thank you, Satnam, particularly for talk, uh, you know, talking about how uh, freelancers and independent journalists don't have that those kind of resources. And so for me, uh, I would like to say I've been an independent journalist for, for many years now. And uh, um, uh, I think the mainstream media model, particularly in, in India, I think, let me say, put it briefly like that, that what has happened is that a lot of bureaus, state bureaus have shut down as part of the revenue model. So which is why the, the news information that would come from employees of news organizations from various places is now being brought in by independent journalists and freelancers. And these people have no, uh, of course, so they are, it's, it's like gig economy. So obviously there's no insurance and there's no kind of backup of any sort. And in, a, in an environment like India, where right now we have been seeing increasing attack on journalists, it becomes very difficult when uh, criminal cases are slapped, for instance, against those independent journalists. So, for example, I also have two criminal cases against me. One is of criminal defamation, which is a colonial law that we continue to have. But the other one, uh, which is uh, inciting communal hatred. 
for, for an investigative piece that I had written on how Hindu nationalist groups are trafficking children from tribal communities in Northeast for the purpose of indoctrination. Now, the thing is that, that like I said earlier also, that this government is especially using law and order related cases and slapping them against journalists. And the moment you file, file a criminal case, it's far more difficult for a freelancer or an independent journalist actually to combat that in the court of law because it goes on for a long time. So the process is the punishment. So the to, to be able to have the kind of legal report, resources or the fact that I my cases are in Guwahati, which are almost, uh, you know, uh, I live in Delhi. So, which means that it's almost 2000 kilometers from where I, I stay and I have to go for my court hearings every uh, two months for that. So not everybody has that kind of resources, particularly when you are a freelance journalist. So for me, particularly, it was very uh, uh, important that I get support from uh, 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 press bodies and these kind of associations globally to in my legal case, first of all. And secondly, I would also like to say that when uh, and uh, and why it's more important to me now is that the fact that in 2016 when cases were slapped against me these were the first case one of the first few cases uh, filed by this government against journalists and which is why a number of press bodies were very reluctant to, to even take positions and come out in support of journalists and which is why for me it was helpful that international organizations when they started issuing statements of support is when Indian press bodies also sort of got some kind of morale from it, morale boost, and they started talking about it. So I think that kind of international pressure is absolutely important, particularly in these times when a lot of our press bodies, uh, like say in India, are uh, no, are afraid to speak to true to, to, to the power, to the press bodies, the the local press body associations, all of them. So which is why it's, it's absolutely important, first of all, to provide the kind of, uh, first of all, statement of support. And secondly, the kind of resources that are important to go and fight your case in the court of law, which, which is, is, is like a huge challenge now, particularly for freelance journalists. Even in the last one year in India, the uh, so many journalists have been charged for uh, with number of cases un under the National Disaster Management Act or the e Epidemics Act because they've been doing very basic important stories such as the lack of PPE kits or the lack of oxygen in hospitals. And even for that, that the template that the central government started with filing law and order related cases, state governments are following the same template as well. So there is no resource at all to, to report. So if anybody is interested in any bare minimum basic reportage or journalism that, that should be there, I think uh, the support of international journalists, uh, international uh, groups for independent journalists, uh, which is now part of the new mainstream media model, I think that really needs to be taken into account. Very powerful, Neha. That's really helpful. And I think you know, in a, in a similar way, um, you know, I, it's actually, I'm familiar with both of your stories, but I hadn't made the connection that actually this sort of same process of weaponizing the law against journalists kind of played out in both of your cases. And in, in Mimi, I know the government in Cameroon was, was very much using this sort of 2014 anti-terror legislation as kind of a sweeping way to get rid of any critical press. Um, and I guess I'd be curious for you, um, you know, we've often seen this sort of challenge, particularly in Cameroon, where the the there's almost a dismissive of like, oh, we don't care what the international media says. And yet what we've found is that when the international groups do get involved, it does seem to help the journalists. And I'd be curious, you know, what was your experience like? You know, I know you were your your case really kind of blew up for a while there. And I'd be I'd be curious for you what that experience was like, you know, and, and what worked or what was helpful. Uh, to answer your question, Katie, I would uh, carry I want to uh, revisit uh, one of the reasons that you cited um, as to why journalists have been arrested. You said the politics and then human rights and many other reasons come after. When um, we say politics, it means that the journalist who is actually being indicted or being accused of maybe uh, terrorism or being accused of uh, maybe uh, spreading false information, you are face to face a regime which is more powerful than you are. 
even if you are the daughter of a minister, even if you're a daughter of a director, it's be, it becomes very difficult because you are against, you are facing a government, you are facing a president who is more powerful. What more of a journalist who has nothing, what more of a journalist who is, who is just maybe just struggling to, to cope? When I think about my case, for instance, it's not just me, I'm thinking as well about a case of a colleague like Wazizi, may he so rest in peace who had to die because he didn't have the kind of mobilization that I had. I would want to tell you briefly my story when immediately I was arrested and somebody very close to me, uh, whose name I, I'm not going to mention, uh, she um, came to prison, met me and told me, we don't have any director, we don't have any minister, we don't have anybody who is going to help us get you out of here, what are we going to do? And I said, if we don't have, then I think I'm going to stay here. But guess what? I must say that um, it was clearly thanks to national and international solidarity and the unprecedented mobilization that I saw that made it possible for me to leave prison. The impossible part of it was how people mobilized. Everybody took it as a personal issue. And thanks to that, I made my way out of prison. I didn't even know how this happened. Everybody decided to talk about free me, 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 for, free me, 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 for because our police is not in prison. For the first time in my life, actually, I witnessed oppression becoming coward in the face of what I call numbers. Who would see that happening? Because we saw the crowd and then an oppressive regime being there, being overpowered by this huge mobilization. And they say, what is happening? So I, the, all the charges against me were dropped. I went to court a few days after, and then the president himself took the decision that she should be released. Not because the, the, the government thought that I was innocent, but because the mobilization, it was overpowered by the level of mobilization that he saw. Now, I was scared, actually. I was scared that because you are doing your job, you have gone to prison because you are doing your job. But long story short, I now traveled to London um, shortly after and um, I resumed publishing again because initially I stopped writing on the platform because I was scared. The main reason why they put you behind bars is because they want to shut you up. They want to silence you. They want you to be scared. They don't want you to tell the people's story. So truly I was scared shortly after I was released. But later when I went to London, I was free. I felt like I have to start writing. And God's willing, we create a, a francophone platform, a French speaking platform of Mimi Mefo Info, which is now Mimi Mefo Info French. We had to launch it now. That was in 2020 last year. So my team came together. We have been working towards that. And I also should say that I survived uh, uh, that time and now because of so many demobilization at the level of international uh, press freedom organizations like the CPJ Reporters Without Borders. When I'm talking about CPJ, I also want to um, give a big shout out to Angela Quinta who's been doing a, a fantastic job. She's, um, she's never been tired asking how, you know, CPJ and all that, and even Dutch Valley where I work because uh, press freedom is something that they hold so dearly. That's also one of the reasons why I'm here. So it's it's very, very important that like um, Satnam was saying that when a journalist is in jail and we see this level of mobilization, possibly if Wazizi had that, maybe if Wazizi was even working with Al Jazeera, he would still be alive, even if he's in jail. So where you work, where you also come from, it matters. And if we have colleagues who are really high up there, who are out there, who've got the voice and they can speak for us, who can speak for journalists who are currently behind bars, somewhere in Cameroon, for instance, they are being jailed, like Paul Chuta, who is now in jail. And he has somebody possibly in Al Jazeera, yeah, somebody even with the BBC, yeah, somebody with Dutch Fele, who can say that release these journalists who are currently behind bars is going to really, really be helpful. Thank you, Mimi. Um, and I'm sure Angela would be grateful for the shout out. Um, I guess uh, I first want to just open it to the audience. If anybody has questions, please submit those through the Q&A function. We'd be happy to take those. Um, I do uh, in the meantime, I have a question for, for both you, Jessica and Satnam. Um, kind of, you know, we, we've heard a lot, especially, you know, from, I think, Mimi and Neha about 
the importance of solidarity and this sort of feeling of, you know, someone's standing with you, someone's, you know, they haven't forgotten about you. They're, you know, there's sort of this collegiality. And I think um, I'd be curious, you both work with, you know, news organizations. Um, there's sort of often been this perceived tension between, you know, we are a news organization and we are objective and not involved in advocacy um, or not cause driven. And, and this sort of need to protect and keep journalists and reporters safe. Um, and so, you know, it, at least in our experience, you know, as, as a group that's always asking people to make noise, it's a, it's a rationale that we hear a lot about why, you know, media groups might steer clear from signing on to something or joining uh, forces on, on a particular campaign. And I guess I, I have two questions. One is, you know, what do you think has changed that we're seeing sort of more, you know, whether it's the One Free Press Coalition or even more advocacy from Al Jazeera or something like the Washington Post Press Freedom Partnership, you know, we're, we're seeing more of this type of engagement from traditional media groups. Um, and then I guess my, my follow up to that is how can we convince more media groups to take up this call? Or how can we, you know, get more of these kind of traditional media organizations to see that this kind of advocacy is not necessarily in conflict with their mission to report the news? Sanam, can I start with you and then turn to Jess? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> I think we, you know, when, when uh, you know, I would say that, you know, since 1996, we've been sort of facing a history of, of you know, uh, subjugation, oppression, and targeting uh, by, you know, by governments, um, you know, we, it's sort of like this, it's, you know, you can't really feel somebody's hunger unless you are hungry yourself. And, you know, we've sort of like been in, in the sort of the crosshairs of, of, of this situation for a long time now, as I mentioned, you know, many of our journalists in, you know, jail, you know, uh, you know, killed, you know, uh, and, when you feel that pain i think that's when you sort of like rise up and say you know uh this is affecting me too so other news organizations that may not have had that history in the past more and more of them are are, are coming under attack and that sort of makes i think a lot of these organizations think well you know we need to stand up for 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 journalism and free press because we ourselves are being targeted now so i think that the, the the, I mean, it's it's unfortunate that that's happening, and we would, we would hope that it was going in the other direction. That you know we were getting freer and freer in terms of the ability for us to express our opinions, and you know to uh, to, to to create an environment where information you know helps people to make better decisions, and you know become uh, more enlightened. The the reality is that it, it's going in the opposite direction, and so when something hits home, I think that's when people say, well, you know, we we need to do something about this. I think mean, that's why there is a growth in in organizations banding together and saying, you know, we 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 want to work together to uh, because we ourselves are being affected, um, you know, directly. Um, and I just want to sort of add another another and, and maybe sort of uh, talk a little bit about this is that you know it's there's a huge there's a real human you know we talk about the number of of journalists that are killed. And of course, it's, it's not just the journalists, but the impact that that has on their families and so forth. And I think that part of the the support that we need to provide is 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 you know is emotional, it's financial, it's legal, and otherwise. Uh, but you know, a single organization can't do it. They can't do that on on, on their own. Uh, it really has to be a collective effort. And I know you know, for for example, you know, for for you know, freelance journalists, there's the Rory Peck Trust. Um, but that's you know one it's one organization. And, you know, we try to support them and, you know, we, you know, we, we continue to sort of try to work together with other organizations. But I think that the problem is complex now. We're living at a time when, you know, we, we've got, we've got internet, we've got, you know, uh, all kinds of information, fake news, uh, uh, and, you know, as artificial intelligence gets even more, uh, you know, in the fore when it comes to the intersection between uh, in the creation of you know, news articles and so forth by artificial intelligence, and the ability for weaponizing information against uh, against either individual uh, journalists or against uh, organizations, we're really going to have to look at this. Advocacy, I think, is one piece of the puzzle, but the problem itself is much more complex and it gets more and more complex as you know new technologies keep getting invented. And so, 
Um, I think there, the importance of advocacy is extremely important, um, but the challenges that are upon us, I think, demand really a, a thinking process in terms of how it is that we can actually address, you know, all of the, all of the the attacks uh, on 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 the institution of uh, of of of, um, of of the freedom of expression. Um, I think, you know, when we when we began uh, seeking members for the One Free Press Coalition, we were a little bit worried that there may be some resistance, um, just as you say, because there is a sort of historic resistance to doing anything that may resemble advocacy for news organizations. And, and I, I share that um, in terms of taking a particular point of view. Um, but I think we really didn't experience too much of it because there has been such a fundamental shift um, culturally around the world where there are such serious and grave threats to free speech and freedom of expression that I think news outlets see that if we don't step up and do something, our entire um, platform, our entire point of being, our entire purpose is um, under threat of, of, of disappearing. I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but I think the, the foundational purpose is to create the space so we're free to do what we're all out here to do, um, which is to tell the truth, to tell the news, um, to hold governments and people in power to account. And so I think the, the collective advocacy is really just about that. It's about protecting the space to do that, protecting the fundamental right to freedom of expression, um, freedom of the press. And I think that for a long time, um, media organizations, news outlets, and journalists, to a certain extent, took that for granted that that right was there, um, and especially in places like the United States where it's in the Constitution, um, and that since it's there, it must always be there. Um, and what we've seen over the past few years especially is that there are lots of ways to undermine those rights, and if we don't step up um, and speak out, that that they could really be diminished, and we, we won't be able to do what we're all here to do. Um, and so I think there has just been a shift. Um, and I think we are careful not to say that we're taking a particular, you know, point of view about what people should be able to talk about it. The point is they should be able to talk, they should be able to report, they should be able to do journalism, and no one should be under threat of imprisonment, harassment, torture, um, death, disappearance, just for speaking truth to power, you know, which is is the is the core fundamental belief that we're trying to stand up for. So I, I was actually really happy to see that so many large news outlets were um, feeling inclined to, to join this cause. And you can see we have global members from all over and big news outlets that I think may have, as you say, Carrie, historically kind of shied away from the advocacy. They, you know, buy a table for a CPJ um, to support the Press Freedom Awards, but usually kind of stay quiet. And so I, I'm really thrilled that we have so many organizations and and obviously we hope for more um but to use our collective power our collective platforms um has been really uh you know reassuring to me that there are a lot of people out there who believe in free speech and so it's it's nice to see them mobilize together thanks jessica uh, I'm mindful that we only have a few more minutes left, so I'll, I'll try to move through the rest of this quickly. But I, um, you know, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, Neha and Mimi, you know, you you both kind of talked about the the uniqueness of your experience, but I think in in telling your stories, you both also touched on the fact that. Um, you know, you were in some ways emblematic of what was happening to a lot of journalists in, in your countries, respectively. Um, and I guess I'd be, you know, curious from you, recognizing that, you know, there are so many journalists undergoing sort of similar forms of oppression or, or different sort of attacks, whether that's legal, as we've discussed, or, you know, rampant online abuse, physical threats, the, the sort of the full spectrum. I guess I'd be curious for, for both of you, you know, what more can we be doing? What more, um, you know, I, I started this, you know, kicked off this conversation by saying that we're always asked, you know, how can we help? Or we're asking journalists, what do you need? How can we support you? And so I'd love to turn the mic back to each of you and hear, you know, it's very heartening to hear that the advocacy is helping and that the support of these projects are working, but it would be great to know more, you know, from, from you, you know, what more can we be doing or are there, 
um, you know, particular threats or issues that you think aren't getting the attention that they need? Uh, Neha, maybe I'll start with you. Thanks, Kerry. I think uh, what is increasingly uh, important, particularly in the parts where I am uh, placed, is that is the fact that we need to shift the focus. So, uh, like we say, like uh, globally, even here there is there is a hierarchy of gender, caste, class, or say anybody who believe who belongs to a majoritarian religion right now. For India, for example, if you are a Hindu, you are more protected than somebody else. So I think what is important in terms of even support groups and uh, campaigns or efforts that are being mobilized to support journalists, I think there is a there is a degree of intersectionality which is required, which actually reaches out to people who are on the margins on the basis of their caste or their race or their class. Because what is happening in India, let's say, for example, like people like me i i am from a privileged uh, i speak from a privileged position because i'm i'm an upper caste uh, hindu uh, woman living in a metro city in india and writing in english so the kind of resources or the kind of support i can get when i am penalized for my journalistic work is is far more compared to any any journalist in a smaller town on, or in a rural area so i think what is right now important is that the for example, let's say like the across the world, people saw migrant workers walking back home last year in India after the national lockdown because of the pandemic. Who are the people who were reporting on those migrant workers? They were journalists from smaller towns. They were journalists from rural areas who were actually perhaps taking local transport to go from one village to the other, one town to the other, to tell us what is happening to these people. But once cases were filed against these journalists, like I said, like, like for under the Disaster Management Act or under whatever, the Draconian Act, uh, those journalists, because they were writing in non-English languages and they were writing for smaller news organizations, they did not get that kind of legal support. They did not get that kind of even, let's say, uh, prominence or uh, that uh, con the debate in this conversation about press freedom that space. They didn't get that. And I think that is something that really needs focus in, in a country like India, for example, because we write in so many languages and most of our reporting in the country is so huge and most of the reporting is coming from smaller places. I think journalists who are really suffering are people in these remote corners and they do not get any kind of their voices, do not get any kind of amplification. So I think all efforts should be made to have more intersectional approach so that journalists who are doing the most critical work from most remote parts get that kind of space because that is also going to then encourage everybody to keep doing their work that uh, and you know give a sort of message that you're not alone in it right now the resources only reach the metros and like the prominent uh, you know privileged places so i think that that is going to help a lot and uh, Mimi, I'll hand to you. We have a couple minutes left, but I'd love to hear how you think we can be doing more to support. Um, I think um, to me, um, more advocacy is very, very important. Um, legal support is also very, very important, especially to uh, journalists who are back home. I speak with them. Um, I'll take cases um, like uh, those of um, Paul Chuta, Mancho BBC, who is still currently behind bars. Um, I also have um, a colleague who was um, uh, arrested just recently. The major problem that they have, they have uh, the issues with um, legal uh, support. We, we uh, legal fees are very, very expensive for local journalists who are also in Cameroon. And also um, working with local press freedom organizations is also very, very important, like working with them and maybe training sometimes, making them to understand that uh, if a colleague is, is at risk, um, the entire profession in that particular country is also in danger because it shouldn't just be uh, the issue of a particular media house or certain colleagues um, the calling for the release of one of the others who is behind bars, but if the organization mobilizes and notify other press freedom organizations out there, it's also important. We need those trainings back home 
to understand the stakes to understand what we have to do to support our colleagues who are in danger so that they know that together we stand and divided we fall you know there's need for this constant reminder this message that we all have to come together and be be apart it's very very important thank you Mimi and what a what a powerful note to end on so thank you to all of the panelists for taking the time to join us today from all over and thank you to everybody who tuned in um, this has been a, a wonderful conversation so thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you